Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Monday, March 23rd, we are studying Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 through 35. Jesus continues his fifth discourse to his disciples in today's text. He warns them concerning the events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, all the while giving them confidence in his words. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Philip Hoppe. Pastor Hoppe serves at Peace Lutheran Church in Finlayson, Minnesota, and St. Paul Lutheran Church in Bruno, Minnesota. Pastor Hoppe, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Hey, glad to be back with you today to discuss God's Word. Pastor Hoppe, as we get started, give us some context. We're picking up in the middle of, of one of Jesus' discourses here in the Gospel of Matthew. What do we need to know going into the text today? Well, I guess I would say in general, we want to kind of go back, uh, probably just on your last episode, you know, we get uh, the disciples uh, are having this discussion with Jesus. Um, they they reference the great uh, buildings there at the temple, and uh, Jesus, of course, says that, that those are all going to uh, be destroyed, right? not, not one stone left upon another. And in response to that, the disciples uh, ask this question about, well, when when will those things, right, that you've just spoken of, this, this destruction of the temple, if they understood that fully, the, the import of what he was saying, but the things he was speaking about, when are those things going to happen? Uh, and also, what's the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And I would say largely our verses today are going to focus us on the first part of that, that sort of Jesus' answer primarily about what was going to happen at that time that Jesus was specifically referencing when he said, not one stone will be left upon another. Jesus has uh, been, throughout his ministry, really pointing towards the destruction uh, of Jerusalem and the temple. Uh, just, um, you know, recently I was reading again here this story of the Samaritan woman at the well, and there in that account, you know, Jesus references to her, there's going to come a day where uh, not even the Jews uh, are going to be worshiping in Jerusalem, right? We're all going to be worshiping in spirit and truth. So throughout his uh, ministry, he mentions this, uh, but it's definitely been growing, and in this uh, discourse, we're getting right into the heart of it. And like I said, our specific passages then kind of take us in today to say, okay, we're talking about that moment primarily. We'll, we'll talk as we go through. There's a couple things that are a little hard to interpret uh, as we're thinking about the verses in that light, uh, but that's our basic thing that we're dealing with today. What's going to happen in this event that Jesus is talking about where the temple uh, buildings that the, the disciples mark all that are going to be uh, laid waste. As just as a way of introduction, Pastor Hop, because the, I think this is one of the more difficult texts in the Gospel of Matthew. What what are some of those difficulties that we're going to face? Just an introduction here. Yeah, well, I'd say you know, in general, you get certain verses that when we go back and we look at what we know happened uh, around uh, and leading, well, I should say leading up to and in the year 70 AD, and then there was some fallout after that in, in the years that followed that, but in that particular period of history, there are some verses that just right away you read and go, yep, Jesus spoke this in advance that this would happen, and we see the fulfillment of it very easily. But then there are some other verses that we'll read today uh, that seem a little bit uh, uh, grander in scope, uh, cosmic uh, things happening in the skies, and it's harder to say, well, is that referring also to this specific period uh, of, of time and history, or is that referring to a little bit broader time, namely kind of the whole period uh, from Jesus' ascension until his return? And so, um, and then probably the thing that kind of drives that difficulty home is at the end, we're going to get this statement uh, by Jesus where he will say uh, that, you know, uh, all, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And so that kind of really forces us to kind of deal with uh, which things is Jesus referring to there at the end. Uh, and if he says they're going to happen within that generation, right, uh, is that uh, easy to show that those things did happen? 
Yeah, yeah. And we'll we'll explore those as we go into the text. I'm going to go ahead and, and read it for us. This, again, is, is Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse 15. Jesus says, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is in, on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, Look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, Look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. There's the text for today, Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 through 35. So, Pastor Hoppy, before we get into the specifics of, of these verses, it, you, you mentioned how important the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple is in Jesus' ministry, how he mentions it in multiple places, and it grows as he gets closer. Now, it's not an event that's recorded for us in Scripture that it takes place, right? The events of Scripture occur before the year 70 AD, so don't we, we don't get that narrative within God's Word. But biblically speaking— what is the importance of the destruction of the temple in 70 AD? Well, it really serves, I think, two purposes, right? And, uh, you know, we don't often like to dwell upon these things, but obviously uh, at different points in the Scripture, right, God, after being uh, just patient as, you know, anyone could be, in fact, much more than anyone could be, to say it properly, uh, with God's, with his own people and urging them to repentance, there are these times where judgment falls upon God's people. Uh, we might think, you know, the chief events of those uh, that are recorded in the Scriptures would be, you know, the falling of the northern kingdom and then the falling of the southern kingdom. And I think in a way, right, how Jesus speaks about this happening uh, that is going to occur, as we know, in 70 AD, uh, is really to be thought of in those terms. It is a judgment that comes upon the generation of people that were there when Jesus was alive and did his miracles and spoke uh, with authority and all the things we have heard about in the Gospel of Matthew so far. Um, this is this is when we're looking at that, we see that uh, all these things are, are leading up to 70 AD, and yet this is going to be an act of judgment upon those who have been there, that have seen these things. And so it, it, that's one thing I think we really need to get. And, and in that light, then, it also becomes sort of the visible and manifest end of the Old Covenant. And what I mean by that is when Jesus shows up, like the book of Hebrews would tell us, that's the end of the covenant, the old covenant, and the beginning of the new is Jesus' arrival. But for the people to see that super clearly, it seems that this event of 70 AD is perhaps uh, the most 
easy way to see that, if that makes sense, that all of a sudden when the temple's gone and the sacrifices can no longer go on, it's fairly clear that something drastic has changed. And all of this, and then again, at, at God's hands. Right, that something has changed, namely that no longer is the the temple the place of sacrifice, but the once-for-all final sacrifice has been given in the flesh of Jesus Christ. Is that, with your second point there, is that what you're driving at? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, the, the new covenant is in full effect and, and right at the key of that, that, or at the center of the new covenant is Jesus, the sacrifice he made, right? And then the, the, you might say the distribution, right, of the fruits of that sacrifice uh, in the church through, through word and proclamation and sacrament. So uh, there is this, this drastic changing. And again, Jesus had said it already occurred, but when the temple falls, uh, this also is just a way that, that we see how true Jesus' word is in general again. It's another prediction that he makes that comes true. And so we say all his other words are true, right? If he said this and that happened, I have even more confidence. And when he says my sins are forgiven because of his death, they are indeed forgiven. Mm, right. The, the only other thing that I think maybe I would add in terms of the the destruction of the temple, and and maybe this is part of the difficulty that we were talking about in this passage, is that I think it also can provide us a a picture, perhaps, of what will happen on the last day. We Maybe we we talked a little about that, um, and I don't know if I talked about it with you particularly, but when we were studying the book of Amos, one of the big themes for Amos is the day of the Lord, this day of judgment that's coming. And and you, you brought up even the destruction of Samaria in 721 at the hands of Assyria and the destruction of Jerusalem earlier in in uh, 587 at the hands of Babylon, right? And so you've got these these days of the Lord that that occur. They they all come to fulfillment in the day the Lord happens to Jesus on Good Friday and all then point forward to the last day when when Christ returns in glory. And so perhaps that maybe is a, a third purpose of the destruction of Jerusalem, biblically speaking, is a, a precursor of a, a picture in miniature, perhaps, of what will happen on the last day as well, which I think is going to be some of the difficulty that we're going to see in the text today. What do you think? No, I, I think you're, you're exactly right on this. So, I mean, if we can put it this simply at this point, if, if everything Jesus spoke was in one way to speak only about the events of 70 AD, they would also still relate to the judgment day, the final judgment day, uh, because the one is a small picture of the other. Uh, And so, yeah, I I definitely think you're exactly right. And again, in two ways here. One, uh, we don't want to forget when we talk about some of the terrible things that happened in 70 AD, that Christ is actually part of the purpose, in fact, maybe the main purpose of why he speaks about all of this is to save his people from that destruction, right, that's going to occur. And so there we get this total picture of Judgment Day where those who have rejected him do uh, undergo, right, uh, a terrible time. And yet those who look to him and heed his word, right, are ultimately saved and brought relief. Right, right. So let's let's start looking at some of the specifics, at least as far as we can tell. There's going to be some things in here that we may not be able to pinpoint exactly what, what Jesus means because we've perhaps lost something, but, but Matthew's hearers would have known, even get that, that editorial comment from him in verse 15, let the reader understand. The, the first thing in our text today that Jesus brings up is the abomination of desolation, and he mentions that this comes from the prophet Daniel. So, Take us into what Jesus is getting at. What is this abomination of desolation that we learn about from Daniel? Right. So as you said, Jesus actually, you know, not only uses this phrase, but he actually directs the people to the book of Daniel. And we know uh, from other history that the book of Daniel and some of those books that really have this kind of uh, apocalyptic uh, style were very popular leading up to Jesus' day. And so it seems that the book of Daniel was sort of, you know, a verse that, uh, or excuse me, a book that would have been discussed a lot in his day. And he says, okay, uh, there's this thing uh, that Daniel speaks about, and that's what I'm going to speak about now. The word itself, right, we just kind of take the two words. The abomination is there's going to be something that is completely out of place and completely offensive to the Lord, right? That's kind of the the idea of abomination, is that there's something that um, God would look upon uh, and would be displeased in every way with. The desolation part, then, is that that thing that occurs is actually going to somehow cause the place where it occurs to become 
desolate. So that's kind of the basic idea of that phrase is there's going to be something offensive that happens in a place, and that place then is going to become desolate. And again, that's what we overall uh, end up seeing occur in 70 AD, that there is some event that occurs, uh, and there's a large kind of series of events that go on in that period, but that after that, again, the the things get so serious and, and the temple is destroyed that that place, the temple and the city itself is largely uh, left desolate. And for Jesus's purpose, the key part is that it's desolate, not in, in the grandest sense, but it's desolate in the sense of it is no longer the place where God is going to be dwelling, right? Instead, right, uh, Christ uh, is the place where God is dwelling, and then as, as the church goes forward, right, his people uh, are also spoken of as the temple of God, right, once Jesus ascends. But uh, so you get all these kind of ideas going here, but the basic idea is something's going to go on that's going to uh, be offensive to God and probably to his people as well, and then things are going to go desolate, so we're looking here, as these verses get started, this would be one of those spots where I think we would say pretty conclusively or pretty confidently that we're talking about 70 AD here. So as we look at the events of 70 AD, the events leading up to it, can we pinpoint what this abomination of desolation would have been? No, oh, that's sort of part of the problem with these particular verses is, you know, people that take the Word of God very seriously, view, view it as inspired, and also know the history of 70 AD, uh, none of them say, well, without question, it has to be this event or that event. Uh, we can throw out a couple things that we know sort of happened uh, that would sort of fit the definition, right? Um, uh, again, you know, uh, people might have to go and read a little bit more about 70 AD if they want the full scope of, of everything that went on there, because, you know, just in an hour, we probably, you know, we could spend the whole hour just describing that, and, and I wouldn't be your best guess to do that anyways. But, but you know, of all this stuff going on where, you know, at least in general, if we can say, right, there is conflict uh, between uh, the Romans uh, and the Jewish people. Uh, and, uh, you know, depending on which account you read, uh, people will pinpoint, you know, sort of who started it, probably according to who they want to start it. <laughs> uh, but there's definitely trouble between the two. And at a certain point, uh, there uh, the Romans come down and siege the city of Jerusalem, uh, and things get very dire very quickly. And interestingly, inside of that uh, siege, as the Jewish people are largely inside the city uh, and the temple grounds even to some extent, um, when they are there, there is this this uh, dire nature going on, and they even start warring against each other, particularly the zealots. Uh, we hear that word in the Bible, right? Start arguing against the other common people, uh, so much to the point where at one point the zealots sneak out and they go and get the Edomites uh, to come in and help them uh, basically take power in the temple. So some people think that activity of going and getting the Edomites, this uh, pagan nation, which largely was supposed to be laid waste, right, uh, by God's decree, uh, now they are brought in to help the zealots kind of keep their power in the temple. So that's an abomination, right, that God's people would trust not in him, but would go out to a pagan nation and ask them to come. And literally, they come into the temple uh, and do some pretty heinous things from everything we can tell, you know, a lot of slaughter uh, of fellow uh, um, Jewish people are, are slaughtered in that account. So that could be it. The second thing is when the Romans actually show up, the Romans always carried with them uh, various things, uh, various emblems that were meant to give honor and, in fact, worship to the Roman emperor. Uh, so some people say it's when the Romans actually finally go into the temple, which is what happens uh, on, in 70 AD, that that's the abomination, that these godless symbols of pagan worship are brought into the temple. The final thing could just be that really is a much broader kind of thought here that when the Romans are coming in to destroy the city, that indeed that's what's being spoken of here is the whole event is sort of the abomination. The, the reason that last one makes a little sense is, as we said, Jesus is really telling this to the people so that they have a chance to flee. And if you go with either of the first 
too, and, and particularly the fact of the Romans actually getting inside the temple, that seems to be too late <laughs> for the people of God to flee uh, at that point. And so most people tend to go with one of these other options, because when, when the people saw it, and here, yeah, don't we wish we had one of these readers who would understand? You mentioned that note, right? Because <laughs> they could tell us, oh yeah, we, when Jesus said this, he meant this, right? And when we saw it, we knew it. Well, we, we don't quite have that. Uh, but they obviously did because they did leave, right? We know that from history, too, that the Christian people did uh, probably in about 68, right, two years before the actual uh, event of the Romans going into the temple. They did, in large groups, leave uh, and flee to the mountains, just as Jesus said. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's a good point, I think, as we try to consider, even if we can't pin it down, that Jesus is speaking these words to warn his people to get out, because it is it's going to be bad. And and history does show forth that. You've, you've dig, dug in a little bit to the history, Pastor Hoppy, and, and I know you, we can't give a, a full account of everything, but, but continue to paint that picture of what this siege of Jerusalem was like. Jesus gives us some, some pictures here. What, what should we have in our minds when we think about this? Well, yeah, I think one thing is, blessedly, right, we, we just don't think, unless you're a real student of history, we don't maybe even get the whole idea of a siege, right? But you're essentially, you know, taking your army and making sure nothing can come in or go out. Um, and again, you know, we're not talking about uh, all of the conveniences of the modern world we have, where there might be, uh, you know, all sorts of ways to get rid of waste and to get rid of other kind of things like that. We're simply not dealing in those times. And so when a city was sieged, uh, all sorts of awful atrocities happened there. I mean, we have accounts that there's, you know, famine inside uh, the, the, the city of Jerusalem. There's disease that is just spreading and spreading. Uh, we even get gruesome accounts of mothers, right, eating their own children uh, and just, you know, having just these awful uh, experiences of, of, you know, everything has just gone terribly and people are making drastic choices they would never make. Right. And just for the sake of, of completeness, what, I mean, is there, what kind of timeline are we talking about? How does all this end up, how does this end, I guess? Give us just sort of the, the historical account in brief. Yeah. So, I mean, essentially, again, you know, the, the siege starts uh, about four years before it ends. So, you know, around 66 um, is when the final siege, and again, there's been other things leading up to this, but kind of this final siege under uh, this guy named Titus is kind of sent in as the Roman commander. Uh, his father uh, sends him in to kind of take care of this situation. His father is sort of in the process of becoming emperor after Nero dies. Uh, and so he is, um, you know, he's trying to get his power solidified, and so he sends Titus in to do this. But then, um, you know, this goes all the way up until 70, and when they actually go in, right, the suffering only increases. I mean, the, the story, at least, as we get it in history, is that Titus, the guy that is the commander, he actually wants to go in and just take over the temple, because he understands there's a lot of value in there. I mean, read the scriptures about how much gold <laughs> was used, uh, you know, in the temple. Uh, and he sees a lot of value there. But the story is at least that his some of his soldiers are over-exuberant and perhaps a little inebriated as well, and they end up setting everything on fire. But the picture you get is there's just, there's flames and fire everywhere, and then the Roman soldiers are going in, slaughtering people. Uh, we have one kind of firsthand account from this that's recorded in history, and the guy there, you know, I mean, he talks about, you know, having to step over uh, all sorts of corpses and that the altar is, you know, covered in blood. I mean, you know, don't, hopefully no one's eating right now, you know, as they listen. Uh, but it, it is a gruesome scene from, from start to finish. And the temple indeed is laid waste along with the city, right? Uh, there's fire everywhere, buildings are being destroyed, and it's just laid waste. Yeah, it was it was a gruesome scene indeed. And you, you get that from Jesus' own language as he, he talks about his people fleeing to the mountains. And, and it's going to be so bad that even verse 19 really stands out. Situations that one normally would have considered very blessed for a woman to be pregnant or, or nursing. Jesus says, oh, alas for those people, because that's how bad bad it's going to be. So this is, this is absolutely just an, an awful event in terms of the, 
I mean, the history, like you said, it's not the type of thing you want to you want to be looking at or watching over breakfast. Uh, Pastor Hoppy, is uh, we've got just a minute here before the break. This is stuff that happened in in AD seventy. For us today, what is the benefit of reading these words of Jesus? How do we take them and apply them to us when these things have already happened? Well, again, in the end, I think we want to look towards the final day, the last day of judgment, right? And again, rejoice that just like Christ here tells his people uh, to escape the judgment is, that is coming, Christ has told us that as well. And so we want to escape that judgment and not, again, uh, just by running away from it, but in this case, running directly to Christ, who is our Savior, who is our salvation. And so I think overall, that's, we do take this as a picture of what is still to come for us, and we run to Christ uh, for his salvation. Um, there could be all sorts of other things here that, that could be taken, you know, in terms of our day and, and what's going on in our day. But I think in general, that's where we kind of want to end up with our thoughts. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on Worldwide KFUO, looking at the middle of Matthew chapter 24. Jesus talks about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. We're going to take a short break, but we will be right back. Please stick around. Since 1978, Lutheran Church Extension Fund has had the humble privilege of supporting Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and her workers. Thanks to faithful investors, LCEF has provided thousands of church workers, congregations, schools, and organizations with the low-cost loans and resources they need to reach more people with the saving name of Christ. To learn more, visit lcef.org or call 800-843-5233. 800-843-5233. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. On this Monday, March 23rd, we're looking at Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 through 35, with Pastor Philip Hoppe of Peace Lutheran Church in Finlayson, Minnesota, and St. Paul Lutheran Church in Bruno, Minnesota. Pastor Hoppe, prior to the break, we were talking about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, the, the awful event that occurred there in 70 AD at the hands of the Roman army. And, and Jesus very clearly is talking about that when it comes to the abomination of desolation and this matter of, of fleeing to the mountains, the, the great distress that will be occurring in those days, especially for those who, who would have children with them, or, or if it was in the winter or on a Sabbath day, it's going to be very, very difficult. And, and as Jesus continues, this is where things maybe start to, uh, Jesus, what are you talking about? Are we still talking about 70 AD? Are we talking about your return? Where, where do we start to see this where, where things maybe get, there's maybe some question as to, is Jesus talking about AD 70 only, or is he talking about his return also? Yeah, I think we get this, if we can take it back to where we started with the disciples' question, right? It seems that perhaps their question, when they ask, when are these things going to happen, and what's the sign of your coming and the end of the age, uh, I think most people assume there that they kind of think all those things for sure go immediately together, right? Well, sitting where we do, we know that those things did not go immediately together, right? It wasn't that there was 70 AD, and then in 71, Jesus returned, right? Uh, when, when we say returned here, we mean the final return, right? If so, we wouldn't obviously be sitting here talking today. Um, so, you know, you've got this kind of whole thing going on, and in the, the next verses then, um, we get these phrases, like one where he says, you know, that if, if these days had not been cut short, uh, no one would have been saved, right? Uh, but God cuts them short. Well, again, it, it can start to sound like, well, that would be easier to apply to the whole period uh, from Jesus' ascension to the return, that everything that happens there, if that went longer, if Jesus did not return at a certain point, uh, it would indeed increase the number of people uh, who might even fall away because of the difficulties or literally would just be, um, would no longer be able to live due to the difficulties, I guess, either way there, whether you're talking about physically or spiritually. Uh, and, and so then we get, you know, also this talk about false Christ and false 
profits. Uh, and again, some people have went to decent length to show that there were some of these things going on uh, pretty much immediately after Jesus um, had ascended back into heaven, that there were false Christs that came. So it's certainly, that's why we can always say it can refer to this time period. These things that he's talking about were going on. Uh, but then probably in this next section, uh, particularly the verse where it says, you know, for, for as the lightning comes from the east uh, and shines as far as the west, so will be with the coming of the Son of Man. Um, and so it seems, again, that what he's talking about here in these next verses more easily applies, or, or you know, it, if you were just reading these verses, maybe if I put it that way, you weren't reading in the larger context, you would go, oh yeah, coming of the Son of Man, that's strictly last day speaking, uh, and that's what's going on. And yet, in the context, Jesus doesn't seem to make a huge turn from what he's been talking about. And like we said at the end, he's going to say all these things <laughs> have occurred, right, or will have occurred uh, in this generation. And so that's kind of where the difficulties uh, begin to pile up here a little bit. And again, like I said, scholars of uh, good faith, right, the people that are not trying to um, uh, debate, uh, you know, whether the scriptures are inspired or whether they're inerrant, but, but fully believe those things, uh, do come to different uh, conclusions about that. Right, right. So, for example, in verse 22, the matter of days being cut short as a, a mercy of God, particularly for his elect, uh, we could apply that to the events before 70 AD and, and leading up to it, that the Lord in his mercy made those days shorter than they could have been. The, the Roman army could have laid siege to Jerusalem much longer. We also know from the rest of Scripture that the Lord is is merciful in the ways that he that he approaches his timing of the last days that that he does that for the sake of the elect as well. I do think that that's the the key phrase there that we want to hold on to, especially as we think about these words for us today. That that the Lord is, as we think about him, especially in the last days, that the Lord is approaching the last days for the sake of the elect. He's doing these things for the sake of his church. Our brother Christ sits at God's right hand and he's reigning for our good. There's there's just tons of comfort for us there in the midst of, of the world that we live in. The the matter of false Christ, false prophets, like you said, I, these things did happen prior to AD 70. Well, we also know that that false teaching is is occurring still today. So again, this is kind of what we were talking about at the beginning, that, okay, here's here's the events of 70 AD, but, but when we look at them, there's a lot of things that sure sound a lot like what we know is going to happen in the days before Christ's return as well. And that's where, where some of the, the difficulty comes in. I, I do think, as, as you said, the, the really where it really gets difficult is with that phrase in verse 27, the coming of the Son of Man. We hear that phrase, and I know my mind automatically goes to the last day when, when Christ returns, raises from the dead, and, and we are with him forever in, in resurrection life. That, that's where things really, really get difficult. Uh, Pastor Robbie, take us into some specifics in this section, verses 20 through, 22 through 28. Yeah, well, I think as you uh, said, you know, one of the things I really hope we don't lose uh, today in our discussion, right, is that while some of these details and their, uh, you know, their fulfillment are hard for us where we said to figure out, right, what is not hard to figure out is that God is doing this for the salvation uh, and for the benefit of his elect, those he has chosen unto salvation. And so, uh, like you said, that's one thing we definitely want to get here, whether it's, uh, you know, we didn't talk about the specifics, but the fact that they're supposed to flee and get out of town, right? Even some have suggested what Jesus is saying, they literally should run from rooftop to rooftop, right? Don't even go down to the ground. You run as far as you can on the rooftops, and then you can continue going from there. But that's, that's going to be hard when they have to do that quickly, but it's ultimately, right, for their salvation. And, and here again, at this point, we get this similar uh, kind of idea, and certainly the talk, that whatever God is doing, he is doing for the benefit of his elect. And that is a particular message that no matter what's going on in the world is very important to take to heart, right? This is not just uh, general comfort that says, well, God's going to always take care of me, and we read that as like exactly like I think. No, that's not the promise that God will do exactly what you think is best, but he has promised that he will do what is best in the most holistic body and soul sense possible for those 
right, whom he has chosen unto salvation, those who believe and are baptized, that's anything that's going on, <laughs> he's working to that end. And that's what we see here uh, in these verses. Um, the last part of those verses that we probably should, you know, get on a, a little bit more or get to a little bit more specifics on is, um, you know, this, this talk at the end. And especially if we do take it at least in some way to refer to the last day, whether, again, that this is something that sort of occurred in 70 AD but will occur in all of its fullness on the last day or whether this is specifically about the last day, is just this idea that when that final coming occurs, right, we will know that it has occurred. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to wonder if somebody says, no, Jesus, right, he's, uh, we saw him, he's over in Jerusalem, or, you know, he, he's standing in, you know, Paducah, Kentucky, right, or whatever. You don't have to go, well, perhaps, perhaps Jesus has come, and perhaps I should go there and, and you know, go where he is. No, when this occurs, it will be so obvious to everyone. Uh, even the last phrase there, which is a little harder to interpret, right, where we get this, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather, uh, it sort of seems to stand out where you go, okay, I, I, even if I thought I knew exactly what was being talked about, here's this kind of weird idiom. But I think the whole point there is just that uh, you can imagine this, right, that if you're going down uh, a path on a hike or something like that, and you see a bunch of vultures that are circling around, um, you, you wouldn't even really need to go check and see if there is some sort of dead animal beneath them. It's assumed, yes, that's, that's why vultures cultures gather. The same thing here is that when Jesus appears, his appearance will be the same thing. You won't have to go check out, what does this mean? Is this the coming of Christ? No, you will know it immediately to be what it is, that this is the return of the Lord Jesus. And that's that's comforting for us, especially in a world of sometimes Christians that want us to kind of try to search all things out in the Scripture to the level of, you know, getting all these prophecies and trying to figure out details and times and places. And Jesus says here, don't, don't chase after that stuff, right? When I come, you'll know it, right? And it'll be for you, my people, that I'm coming. Right, right. So, as as the language then, as Jesus continues in verse twenty nine, that's that's where the language really starts to become, at least I think the way most Christians today would hear it, it it really starts to sound like what we talk about last day talk. There's there's Jesus talking about the sun being darkened, the moon not giving its light, stars falling from heaven, the the sign of the Son of Man appearing in heaven. All tribes. This is a, a global thing that Jesus is talking about. Angels going out with a loud trumpet, gathering the elect from all over the earth. This, I think, to most American Christians, probably, and I, maybe most Christians today, sounds like last day talk. But, but we've we've said that there are those who would say that this whole section, all the way up until you get to verse thirty-six, which we'll look at tomorrow, that all this is talking about AD seventy. So maybe the place to start with in verses twenty-nine through thirty-one, Pastor Oppie, is. If Jesus is only talking about A.D. 70, how does he use the language that he does in verses 29 through 31? Right. So if we're going to take this as referring to, to 70 A.D., and again, when we get to those final verses, we'll say maybe why we should, right? There's, that's kind of what leads us that way. If we do, we can certainly say there are times in the Scriptures, right, and events that occur in the Scriptures where something is occurring on the ground, and the scriptural language surrounding it speaks about sort of the whole creation being wrapped up in it. And in those times, we don't know that necessarily it always means that there was some visible manifestation to the average human eye, right, that, that creation is wrapped up in this. I mean, this is pretty basic biblical stuff that this is always occurring, right? The creation, the sun, the moon, all these things are kind of involved in this cosmic struggle that's always going on, but we don't always see See it, right? I mean, there's a cosmic battle going on today, right? Wherever you are, whatever the situation is, and yet you don't look up in the sky and necessarily see the sun or moon doing something odd, right? So it's possible that this language is, is just to 
kind of be a little bit of metaphorical language that really gets us to the seriousness, the gravity of the situation that is occurring. And if you're going to take this as referring to 70 AD, then that's kind of how you take these passages is that this was such a monumental switch. And like we said, if it's really from old covenant to new, that is a huge event, right, in, in salvation history. Um, and the judgment upon those who knew and saw Christ and yet did not receive him, all these things are grand events. And so to speak of them as affecting the entire creation is certainly not out of hand. Uh, the last verse, some might just wonder, well, what about, you know, this whole, the loud trumpet call and the angels? Well, uh, the people that would say this is about 70 AD would actually say this is metaphorical language to speak about the church going out, in particular the apostles, right, that Christ sends them out to the ends of the earth, which certainly, right, he does. Uh, and he, why is he doing that? To gather his elect. That's how he gathered his elect, is by sending out his church uh, to uh, all the ends of the earth. And so, again, it certainly, you have to take it a little bit more metaphorically, but it certainly is not um, inconsistent with the gravity of the situation or even the specifics of how God then goes out and gathers his elect. Hmm. Uh, you're right. There, there are other places in the scriptures that use similar language, in, at least in my mind. One of the, the places we could consider is in, in Acts chapter 2, when Peter is preaching his Pentecost sermon. He opens up with that quote from the prophet Joel that talks about in the last days, the, the Lord pouring out his spirit. And, and within that, it, it talks about showing wonders in the heavens, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and, and vapor of smoke. Well, on the day of Pentecost, obviously there, there's the, the flames on over their heads. There's the, the loud rushing wind that they've heard. There's the, the speaking in voices. But the, those signs aren't necessarily there visibly, but, but Peter uses that language and applies it to that day of Pentecost. Joel used that language when he wrote and applies it. Think of, again, to reference the study of the book of Amos, in Amos, the Lord calls the day of the Lord, or Amos calls the day of the Lord, a day of darkness, which, which again, was it literally dark when the Assyrians came and took over Samaria or when the Babylonians came and took over Jerusalem? Well, maybe, or, or, or maybe, again, this is a, a language of all creation, as, as you, you've been saying. So, so it's not out of bounds, scripturally speaking, to, to speak to the matter of angels in the book of Revelation. We, so there are some that would say that John there uses the word angel, not as a, a spirit, right, but rather just refer to a pastor. So, so again, this is a possible interpretation. And to be honest with you, Pastor Hoppe, and, and for the sake of our, our listeners, I, it's hard for me to sort of pick a side, if you will, because sometimes it, uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But then I, I look back at Jesus' language and I, I consider elsewhere in the scriptures where it talks about the last day and wow, this, this sounds a lot like the last day too. So maybe give us that, I don't know, side is maybe not the right word. We're talking about Christians of goodwill on, on both sides, trying to understand what our Lord is saying. But if we take these words as referring more to the last day, what's our Lord talking about here? Well, again, I think we at least then move into the realm, although I don't know that we specifically do either, but that, that possibly, right, uh, there are going to be these things. And here when, we, when we're talking about, you know, we can talk about the last day, and rightly we do speak about the last day, right, from Christ's ascension all the way until his coming. And yet I think we can say biblically that it's clear that at the end end of that period, right, there are going to be some things that are even more intensified uh, than, are, than have occurred in the other portion of that, uh, you know, great uh, tribulation, if we want to use that phrase, right, throughout all that time, there's going to be this increased um, things that are going on that are they're going to be, uh, again, e extreme. And so there, I think we're maybe more tempted, at least, and tempted isn't probably a good word, but to say perhaps some of these signs are going to be a little bit more literal, right, that the sun will be dark and then the moon will not give light, and we're going to see, right, stars falling from the heaven. I mean, again, the, you know, the uh, astronomers, right, of our day uh, tell us that, you know, stars <laughs> uh, can fall out and could, right, impact the earth, right? We don't like to think about that too long, right? It's kind of a terrifying thought, uh, but those things could occur. Um, but if it's about the end in general, regardless, again, if those are 
um, specific literal signs. We get a lot of that in the book of Revelation, right? And we can kind of go back and forth there and go, well, okay, so it says, you know, a third of this is going to happen at this time. Does that mean exactly a third, you know, if the statisticians got it? Or is this a way of saying uh, a large portion of humanity, right? But but we don't want to take the the somewhat literal character of what's going to happen at the end of time totally away, right? There are going to be these these huge things that are occurring. And so I think so I think that's all, um, you know, going on there. But then again, you know, when you get to the end, then this trumpet call uh, becomes, right, the final appearance of Christ. And we get that other places in the scripture, I think, quite clearly, right, that there's this loud trumpet, and God now gathers his elect, not, not in the terms of gathering them to hear the message for the first time, but rather those who have already heard the message, believed, and are baptized. Now he's gathering them together uh, for that great final feast. Uh, so yeah, I think that's the other way to interpret it. And again, I think, you know, either one is at least in the realm of possibility here. I, I wonder sometimes if those two things don't, ha- I, I'm not sure if they have to be mutually exclusive. If, if we can't allow Jesus to talk about both things at once, if that makes sense, that, that in one sense, yeah, he's, he's talking about AD 70 and these things did happen, but he's also at the same time giving us a, as we said at the beginning, a picture and miniature of what's going to happen at the end too. I, I, maybe that seems like a, a way out, right? I want to have my cake and eat it too. But I, I, that's that's just me struggling with those words. No, I, I, I tend to agree with you. Uh, and I think, you know, we do see some of that in the the nature of prophecy in general, right? Where there's something that, uh, where you're reading one part of prophecy and it, there is a clear uh, short-term fulfillment of that prophecy. And there's other parts of the prophecy that seem uh, a little bit too big uh, for what occurred or something like that. So I do think there can be that kind of nature of biblical prophecy in general where uh, you're going, yep, this is about this, and this is about this, and ooh, and maybe there's a little more, right? <laughs> keep, keep tuned, right? It's not over in 70 AD. There's more that's going to occur as well. Right. We've got about seven minutes here, Pastor Hoppy, to, to deal with these last several verses. And, and these are very important, particularly verse 35 is one that we're going to want to hang on to our, uh, for today. But, but here in these last verses, as, as this section concludes, this is where the difficulty becomes. If, if we're going to take verses 29 through 31 to refer to as the last day, then Jesus talking about this generation will not pass away until these ta- things take place. Well, this generation is, is pretty specific, and that becomes the, the difficulty for taking those other verses as speaking only of the last day. Uh, take us into this, this last section, verses 32 through 35. Well, yeah, like you said, I mean, there have been those who have tried to say, well, perhaps the generation is sort of, you know, God's people of all time, or the generation of God's people that live between the ascension and and, uh, Christ's coming. Um, But, you know, most people that especially just do the pure linguistic work, right, is this word ever used that way anywhere else, tend to say, no, it's pretty specific that he's talking about the people uh, that are there uh, in those days. And so, you know, at the very least here, when we look at this, I think we have to say that, um, you know, the, the majority of the things being talked about here in these verses, right, are talking about the things that did occur during uh, the period when this generation that he's speaking to were were living, right, these events of 70 AD. The other thing that's important, right, again, is to get that these signs were going to be visible and manifest for them enough to allow them to flee, right? And so again here, um, this is not, you're not going to know or you're not going to be certain. This is when you see these things, flee to the mountains. And so um, that all gives a lot of credence to the idea that these verses are really about mostly, primarily, uh, first and foremost, whatever word we want to use about the events of 70 AD. And then this passes, you know, this goes uh, very easily then that this is an obvious and true prophecy and there's no uh, trouble with that. Again, I think our problem is we come into these verses sometimes not in their context. And, you know, to be honest, we might read this and go, well, wait a second, did Jesus get it wrong? Right? <laughs> uh, the sun and the moon and, and his return did not come in that generation, right? And we can kind of go, well, what's what's going on here? And that's why it is important to study these passages uh, and not just pass over them quickly, because there is a great and easy kind of explanation in the end that most of these events being talked about, in fact, did occur in that 
generation. Um, and so, again, you know, he says, you know, look, look for these things. When you see them, you're going to know this. And again, we can say that of us too, right? We should be looking for all these signs, wars and rumors of war, and all these kind of things that Jesus says. We too should be looking at them, and they should be to us, while not indicators that, oh, I know exactly how many days are left. Every time we see one, we should go, the return of the Lord is near, right? We always should say that. Um, and that's kind of how we do this. As you said, I think, uh, and if you're ready to go there, you know, the last verse is, is probably the one that we want to, you know, hang on the most. I don't know if you have anything else to say before we get there. No, go ahead and take us into that last verse, the comfort that's there from Jesus' words. Right. So he says, right, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words uh, will not pass away. Or sometimes you get just will never pass away in, in various translations there. Uh, and this is just this wonderful comfort, right, that even the things we think are the most certain, that we think are, um, you know, the most solid things are really the things that are passing away. Uh, and God's word, indeed, is eternal. And that's particularly comforting when we know what his words are and what they say about us, right? So uh, the things we think are, I mean, we think of our world, right? The, the literal world, the created world, we think of that as something that is so, um, you know, it changes, but we think it's not going anywhere. <laughs> and Jesus says here, oh, Far be it, right, from that being true. Even this world, even his original creation, right, uh, is something that is and will pass, is passing away and will pass away. Uh, and indeed, why, what should you hold on to then? Well, not worldly hopes, but put your hopes on what Christ has said. Have that hope of a eternal life to spend with him forever. And no matter what's going on in our world, that thought is critical, right? Especially in times of tribulation or trouble, when we start going, oh, no, all the stuff I value in this world is shaken. My routines are shaken. Everything's going on. seems to be spinning around me. You've got the eternal word to place your hopes on. And if your hopes are there, you will have the peace of Christ. With, with just about a minute left here, Pastor Hoppe, summarize the morning. Give us concluding thoughts on the text. Yeah, I think, I, I apologize, I didn't hear quite your question. Just the concluding thoughts on the text this morning. Oh, as, yeah, about a minute sorry. left. <laughs> I apologize for that, yeah. Yeah, I think just overall, right, like I said, while there's, you've heard us talk about how there is some difficulty in interpreting the details of this, the, there is great comfort. I think of it kind of like we can look at the whole book of Revelation, right? Sometimes people look at that and go, oh, all this scary stuff and all this stuff that's hard to interpret, and yet what's there at the core? Christ is, has come and is coming to save his people, and I think that's really a nice way to look at our passage, too, here. There are things that are hard to interpret, but the overall message is God in 70 AD reached out to provide safety to his people amongst great trouble, and that's exactly what he'll do on the last day. He'll again save us from the destruction of the last day. He'll deliver us unto himself and give to us this wonderful uh, life to live with him forever. Pastor Philip Hoppe is the pastor at Peace Lutheran Church in Finlayson, Minnesota, and St. Paul Lutheran Church in Bruno, Minnesota, helping us this morning with Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 through 35. Pastor Hoppe, thank you so much for your time today. So glad to be with you. Jesus' words will not pass away in the midst of tribulation and suffering in this life, whether it happened for the Christians in Jerusalem in AD 70, whether it happens for you and for me today, that is our foundation. What our Lord has said, what he has promised, the salvation he gives will never fail. I'm your host here on Sharp Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.